Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about sexuality across the lifespan. Why again are we talking about this? Because we are in a psychology class. and In a psychology class, we need to understand all aspects of human cognition, emotion, motivation, how the body works, and also the social context they are exposed to, and how they behave in the social context while interacting with social objects of all different kinds. So, Parts of this lecture, even myself, can be a little uncomfortable talking about because, you know, there are lines drawn in the sand, there are rules of the game, there are cultural norms that must be followed. And so this is one of those lectures, along with a couple other subjects that I, I hesitate a little bit to even address and, you know, even wonder, you know, can we talk about this? Is this acceptable? But again, when you put all of that aside, if we take a scientific approach and we ask the questions, well, the stuff we're about to talk about, does it actually exist? Is it scientifically backed up? And the answer is yes. So to delve into it, the book opens up addressing some things that, you know, at first you might be a little bit shocked to discuss. And again, you might have some culture shock or just the idea of having to wrap around it, but the easiest way I can put it after looking through your book, and please, I'm just going to jump through a little bit of this early stuff and highly encourage you to please just read these couple of pages in your book to know what I'm talking about. But essentially, these parts exist at birth. We all go through this process of self-discovery and peer interaction that begins in infancy that goes through adolescence and then goes all the way beyond we are figuring out how our bodies work what it's like to be human we are driven just like animals by these biological processes and how much of these biological processes are really driving the car and how much of what we're engaging in is conscious. And so I like to draw the line here in that when does consciousness really begin? That theory of mind, that ability to put your mind in somebody else's mind and begin to think abstractly. And again, that ability doesn't even really set in until you know, it's ages seven to 11. By 11, you're pretty well solidified and the ability to think symbolically in your conscious mind is becoming aware and you can maybe think about things. And it just coincides with puberty. It turns out that the moment we're actually becoming fertile, I guess is the easiest way to say it, is also about that time where our ability to think abstractly is kicking in. So again, if you apply evolutionary psychology like we've talked about in the past, why is it that, you know, our frontal cortex doesn't develop before our sexual development occurs? And again, maybe it's because your body doesn't want you to think. It wants you just to go out in the world and explore stuff without so much conscious thinking. But again, the same thing goes with puberty. At least when you're hitting puberty, though, and getting into that sexual age, you should be able to consciously, you know, step back a little bit in your own 13-year-old relationships or whatever it's like when you're a kid and we all were there. You know what I mean? And so again, prior to puberty, especially the ability for a child though to consciously be even aware or comprehend sexuality in like an adult-like sense hasn't really kicked in. And even at that adolescent stage, it's so new and that whole process to self-discovery and figuring out how we are and your body changing and all of that going on, having your first relationships, first sexual relationships, Okay, so again, you got to be asking yourself at what age does that develop? So it's a good way to place to start is once to look at the difference of the unconscious and the conscious mind, unconscious and conscious processes, but then also take a developmental psychological approach, which I love teaching developmental psychology. If you like that class, I teach that too. But if I'm talking about de developmental psychology, again, we're looking at how does these processes develop over time? And so albeit we all have these parts that exist at birth, our body still has these general processes it has to go through to prepare you for things like fertility, which is why, for example, girls that get pregnant at a younger age, for example, um, they tend to struggle because their body isn't even really ready for the baby. So it can be really hard on the body, et cetera, things like that. Um, but your book does open up with, as children, we all engage in multiple things. Um, and I don't want to go too deep into that, but 
these processes of self-discovery. And your book points out that it's both same sex and different sex. So don't assume that children are already born some heterosexual beings. Again, the cultural structuring of sexuality and how social control plays a role in our sexuality, and then how we segregate into groups, and then the norms and value systems of those groups and how that structures our sexuality. Again, all of this can be very, very complex. So we need to be thinking about all that. But essentially, children engage in diverse forms of sexual behavior. Okay. And if you want to know more about that, please just go get into your book. Because again, that's what I'm saying. Some of this is just so taboo. You can't really talk about it. But just Think about it, think about what it was like being a child, and then think about what kids get into. And again, kids are getting into things on their own in individual ways, but they're also doing things in peer interactions. And so the book is very stern when it says, this is a direct quote from the book, that same sex activity is more common than different sex activity in childhood. But that doesn't mean it determines your sexual orientation. Again, it just shows you that the ability of humans to engage in sexual behavior is just incredibly diverse. And this diversity of sexual behavior that we can engage in begins at childhood. And whether it's through masturbation or other forms of self-pleasuring, or whether it's through peer interactions of same sex and different interactions, these things do happen. But it's then at the onset of puberty where, again, that conscious mind kicks in, you have the physical changes, and then the ability of our sexual functioning physically, this is when it really starts to develop, okay? So just because younger children can engage in, as your book discusses, diverse forms of sexual behavior doesn't mean that their bodies have totally caught up to that point where you know, the physical processes of, you know, being a fully developed sexual person comes in. This is the easiest way I can say it without deviating from too many social norms or being too taboo. But again, it's during this age uh, of puberty that physical changes, which again, are not totally understood. The idea of psychology and how the brain works and how the brain interacts with the body and how the hormones interact through the bloodstream to talk to the brain and the brain tells sends signals to your organs to develop is not completely understood. We can see some of these processes, but again, so much of psychology is new and our ability to like trace hormones from your body to your brain and how that triggers all these different process, it's too minute. We don't even have the technology to do that. So that's the idea of even though we know there's these physical changes and we have some understanding of the physical processes involved, like the hypothalamus increasing secretions that cause the pituitary gland to release larger amounts of hormones known as gonadotropines into the bloodstream and that stimulates activity in the gomad, gonads. Again, there's much more things at play that we don't understand. So again, that's the beauty of this psychology, science, and biology. And we're delving into things that we're still learning about, okay? But we know that there's this biopsycho process involved with the physical changes. Uh, for males, it generally occurs from 11 to 12, where we get the increase of testosterone production. And females generally ages 9 to 11 with the estrogen production. Uh, however, the age of puberty, of course, varies. And um, But the age of puberty, we have seen things like the age of puberty uh, onset is associated with age of sexual activity, for example. So females, for example, that hit puberty early tend to engage in sexual activity earlier than those who haven't, for example. Uh, when people hit puberty. And again, the other side of the bio cycle is the social side, right? Because as we're going through these physical changes and figuring out who we are as a people and learning to understand what it's like being a human and we're experiencing all these motivations and emotions and desires and arousals and physical processes and psychological processes, we exist also in the social context. We have to go out in the world and interact with other people. 
And so this is a two-way street. As we're interacting with other people, we then absorb the culture, the norms, the ways of life. We learn about what's okay sexually, what's not okay sexually. We learn about the scripts of dating and how we should engage processes. Um, and so again, it's more complex, but then the society and the social world that we live in is also highly regulating our sexual behavior. So again, if we deviate from cultural norms, we get checked. If we deviate from things that are considered illegal, you know, legal, then we get arrested for doing something illegal like pedophilia or bestiality or rape or any of the other very taboo, deviating from social norms, causing harm types of sexual acts that humans can engage in. But again, we're taught that. We are taught the rules of sexuality, what's okay and what's not. But again, the rules themselves, they deviate between time frames. What year are we talking about? What decade? What century? Because the Alexander the Great, for example, was having sex with men. It was totally normal. But in modern times, can our greatest conqueror be having sex with men? Is that going to be acceptable? Things along those lines. And then you're also looking at, you know, again, homosexual behavior and, you know, raping and pillaging of the Vikings. Like if you were a Viking, would you have raised your son to go rape and pillage and kill priests? <laughs> you know, I mean, so again, Culture is going to definitely play a role here. But again, our sexuality is structured. So in like an anti-homophobic society like America has been for the last like 200 years or something like that, until more recently where you're starting to see more less intolerance toward people that don't identify as heterosexual, for example, again, we would have been arrested or institutionalized for engaging in sexual behavior, maybe even killed you know what I mean? Marginalized in the least. Okay. So when you're looking at the sexual standards, but again, we're in psychology. So that's all sociology. The psychology of it all is we internalize the culture, the norms, the ways of life, and we mold our personalities and our behavior to meet those social expectations. And by conforming who we are as people, then that essentially becomes us the social world influences the way we think, how we view the world, our ideologies. Again, it's insanely complex. But again, it's that nature-nurture process here. That's what we've been talking about, right? We're all born with this humanness and these desires to go get food and sex and water and shelter and comfort and friendship. I mean, yes, friendship is built into your DNA. We are group people. It is built into us to need others right? So your book doesn't go as deep into all of this as I would maybe in like a sociology class or something as I teach that too. But the, the idea of the sexual double standard is we as a society stratify into biological sexes and then we then can socially construct gender categories and then we try to mold people of specific biological sexes into these gender categories and traditional gender categories would say like a woman's place is this and a man's this and then egalitarian gender roles are like, well, whatever, it doesn't really matter to each their own, figure it out. And so our society is maybe somewhere in between traditional and egalitarian gender roles. But again, the gender roles, once you find out the group you belong to, you then conform your identity to the gender roles and expectations of that gender, which then influences your personality, the way you think, the way you act, etc. And again, this also holds up for sexuality, because do we have the same or divergent expectations for males and females? Again, the stratifying into different groups creates separate cultures, female culture, male culture, and then we attach certain attributes to each one of these cultures. And then we all mold our personalities to these expectations. So again, there are different expectations attached to genders. Like when you ask people the question, what's acceptable for a woman? How many people are they allowed to have slept with? One, two, 20. And for a man, what's the expectation of for a man? And, you know, is it a lot more? And if, a, so you can ask the question, like if a woman's had sex with five people, how many people is she going to say she had sex with? And if you ask a man the same question, what kind of answer are you going to get? And psychologists have gone out and studied this and find that women underreport and men overreport, again, so that we can meet the expectations of our society and our culture 
so that we don't get stigmatized. So like, what are they going to say for a girl who's had sex a bunch? Are they going to use some stigmatic language? And what are they going to do for a guy who hasn't had sex at all? Are they going to use stigmatic language? You know what I mean? So that's the idea of the sexual double standard. Um, but again, despite all of this, the sexes reporting experiencing vaginal sex by 18 is similar. It's about 64%. So even though we have these double standards for men and women, it turns out we all engage in about similar amounts. Okay. So reasons for sex, identity, and other factors. Why do people engage in these behaviors? Well, again, we have to consider, are we human? <laughs> or are we dancers, in the words of the killers? That was voted the worst lyrics many years ago when I was living in Tennessee. So I would probably would have been like 20, 21 when that song came out. I remember them saying it. But again, are we human? Is it built into us? So again, you ask why... Does sexuality, you know, is it already built into us like language processes, like language processes, sexual processes, physical parts are built into it. However, we're not born knowing how to use language, right? And we're not born knowing how to be sexual creatures. There's some cool theories about the brain and dreams lately. And the idea of the new theories are the brain, you know, it's born inside of this body and it has to figure out how to move the body and take in all the senses in order to get around in the social environment. But the body is always changing. And so when you're dreaming, when you get those spasms of your legs and arms and stuff, the new theories are is that your brain is sending signals to parts of your body and your parts of your body are sending signals back so they can talk to each other so your can, body can adjust. This is why teenagers trip and again, it's because their body has grown and their brain hasn't totally caught up to how to make the body work with the new adjusted height. <laughs> and so again, the same thing comes for sexuality. Again, we have to learn to use these parts. And again, this could be why women in their 50s report better sex life than women before their 50s, because again, things might be complex and maybe you don't know how to use things or your communication is not up to par to communicate with your partner on how to use things, or maybe it's something like that. But again, it's kind of like that. So why are we engaging in it? It's built into us. We have these drives. And even if you can argue that maybe psychologists will often argue we don't necessarily have instincts. But again, the idea that we don't have some predetermined behaviors is absolutely ridiculous because we do. Like it's predetermined that we go after other people, that we interact, that we seek out rewards, that we seek out comfort, that we seek out food and dopamine. And you know what I mean? Like there's so much evidence to suggest that the idea, this thing, look at a dog, like how much of behavior is built into a dog, how much, you know what I mean? It's, we're not that different in a sense. Yes, we have this outer layer of our brain, which enables us to do art and math. But again, the unconscious mind and the body, they have their mind of their own. The consciousness that evolves much, much later, our ability to reflect and think about the world to increase our ability to survive. I mean, that's why the consciousness evolves, right? It's because our unconscious mind and our body want us to think for a second and be like, okay, take this in. What do you see? So you can help us survive more. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like that, right? So again, why do we engage in these behaviors? It's built into us. And the other side of it is lots of behaviors are built into us. And so and when you live in a stigmatic society that tries to make things look like when they try to label things as abnormal, hence like people that identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual, queer, intersex, asexual have historically been labeled deviant in this culture, but not in other cultures. Okay. There are plenty of times where like, look at the Spartans, the men would take the boys in the woods, not good at all, this is bad, but this is the truth about the Greek Spartans or whatever. They would take the boys in the woods at like five and men and boys would have sex for a long time. And then when the girls, when they were ready to like get married, the boys would put on like a mask and then sneak into their wives' house at night and have sex with them and then run back into the woods with the boys. The boys would wear masks because they were shy. They'd never been with a woman. But what were the boys doing out in the woods? And what were the women doing in the cities? This is actually one of the, I usually use this example as one of the 
only cities, you know, where women ruled in some ancient times. This is one of those places because all the men were having sex in the woods while the women were in the cities. Okay, and then I like to ask questions like, how much does biology infer, infer, you know, the gender that we choose to identify with? Because again, gender categories are socially constructed. And then we try to match up how we feel on the inside with these categories, right? But again, it's undeniable that how we feel influences what we identify with. Like, do you have an emotional attachment to the football team you like? And then think about one you don't really care about. You see the difference? It's kind of like that. I mean, it's a much more broken down, easier way to say it. It's much more complex. But again, and when it comes to the biology of sex and gender, remember that there's lots of men who have tons of estrogen and low testosterone and lots of women with lots of testosterone. There's men with penises and wombs. There are women with two vaginas. It's incredibly complex. You're talking about chromosomes, hormones, gonads, uh, genitalia, and these all can be mixed and blended in so many ways. We have uh, found over a hundred variations of male, female, intersex in diverse combinations of this. And so how much of that is influencing your sexual identity? Like androgen levels in your mother's womb are associated with how much testosterone you end up with. So if your mother had high androgen levels and you're a female and you have high testosterone as a result, does that change the way you identify with your gender? Does it influence what sexual, se what sex you're attracted to? It does. See, it's just so ridiculously complex. Then there's other factors like race and ethnicity. Because we've socially constructed racial and ethnic groups, and we have attached social norms regarding what's acceptable regarding social interaction, most people tend to marry within their race. So like 90% of whites and blacks marry within their race and 75% um, of Hispanics and Asians marry within their race. And then, so you're thinking about sexual behavior when it, you know, who you're going to go after, or who do you seek out and, you know, how much does race influence the way you think? And so again, why are we in a psychology class talking about it? Well, think about how race influences the way you think. And if you were to bring someone of a different race home, would everybody in your family be cool with that? And does that stigma influence who you decide to date? It's very complex. Your book also talks about the effects of adolescent pregnancy, which we talked about last week. But again, it does have detrimental effects on socioeconomic status and other psychological factors. Um, the book also inter uh, discusses contraceptives and condoms and essentially says that adolescents are not doing a very good job of using either one of those, even though teen pregnancy is way down. And so again, I've been trying to try to I've been trying to figure out that one. I don't have an answer to that. If contraceptives and condoms are not being used, by some massive percentage of teens, why is it going down? And is it because teens in general are having less sex? If you look at the trends uh, on sexual interaction encounters and the frequency of how often you have sex, um, you'll see some decreases, You know, maybe since the advent of phones and people doing that. And then your book also introduces sex education, which we've talked a lot, but a little about before. I'll let you guys, you know, you all had your sex education in your high school, but do think about the politics of all of this, politics of abortion, um, you know, contraceptive use, condoms, sex education in schools and colleges, what's appropriate. Again, I'm in a college class, but even some of this stuff in this class is a little bit tough to talk about. One, because there's often high school high schoolers in your college classes these days that didn't used to be there. We didn't used to have all these CCP and access to college classes like high schoolers do now. And so again, even that social norm makes me question things a little bit. When it comes to sexuality in the adult years, again, in modern times, is it anything goes or are we still kind of limited by these or structured by these old ways of thinking. Again, the nuclear family is on a decline. Only 25% of people are a heterosexual couple with kids, okay? Things are changing. In modern times, 45% of adults are unmarried. In 1960, it was only 28%. Dating trends are all over the place from hookups to serial dating to serial monogamy to polyamory to, I mean, it's just 
it's open in the United States in modern times, you know, but crime is down too. So, I mean, if you want to argue that there's like some breakdown in norms, I mean, crime is way down. Drug use is way down. I, I Again, so, I mean, you know, I just want to throw that out there as a counter argument in case that's where your brain wants to go right away. I just, you know, it's gone there before in the past, which is why I'm mentioning it. You know, this idea that there's a breakdown in norms. It's like what you always hear politicians talking about going all the way back to the hippies with their long hair or whatever it might be. And now there are grandparents, <laughs> you know, so whatever. So family types are very diverse in modern times. You have uh, people of different races coming together. In 1980, there were only 200,000 or maybe 400,000, that's it, 400,000 interracial marriages in 1980. And then by modern times, there's over 20 million interracial marriages. That's a significant number. Um, Same-sex marriage is legal. Is it being threatened right now? We'll see. You know, is it going to be part of the whole abortion thing? We'll see. Maybe it'll become a state's right thing, just like abortion has become. We'll see. Um, but that happened. You have a large rise in single parents, single mothers. Um, four out of 10 women get pregnant, unmarried in modern times. And then black single mothers, it's a lot higher for various reasons that we've discussed. But again, racism against... Blacks is resulting in high incarceration of black males when you subjugate a whole race of poverty. Um, how does that affect the family? Things along those lines. Not going to go too deep into that. 24% of people are living with their partner or cohabitating. Um, you have friends with benefits in modern times. One night stands. I mean, it is just very diverse. Your book also addresses sexual satisfaction in the adult years. And it does look at things like orgasm rates. And for boy men, it was like 95% across the board. And for women of diverse ages, it did increase with age. And you saw an increase with marriage. So married women were having more orgasms than unmarried women. But, you know, when we look at things like divorce rates, which I have a slide on a second ago, sexual satisfaction, again, coincides with our social norms about are we cool with you know, communicating about stuff, like how much of not experiencing sexual satisfaction is because people are ashamed or embarrassed to just talk about sex. And so I've heard lectures from sex therapists that say couples should talk once a month. How's our sex life? How's it going? Anything you want to work on? Can we improve this? Just like paying the bills. How's our savings going? Is there anything going on? Can we improve how much money we're saving to set ourselves up for retirement? It's like a same kind of conversation. But again, in the United States, is it tab taboo to talk about sex? You know, in France, is it easier to talk about sex than it is in the United States? And so we need to be thinking about things along those lines. So again, sexual satisfaction comes from a lot of different areas, though. Communication in relationships. It can be physical things. Like if we're looking at sexual dysfunction, which we'll talk about in a little bit, it could be something along the lines of physical. It can be psychological in nature, anywhere stemming from trauma or shame or embarrassment or just being shy. I mean, so think about all the reasons you can think about and those all reasons fit because it's very, very complex. Maybe you just don't know how to use the body. Maybe you need to engage in sexual exploration, whether it's self-pleasuring or working with your partner and everyone learning together, whatever it might be. And then the book also addresses great, interesting questions. Are love and sex connected? And so again, it's said that orgasms and sex are related and love and sex, they say increases sexual satisfaction. But what is love? But just those feelings of oxytocin and dopamine and all the other good feelings, right? That blend of all those feelings. So again, the more neurotransmitters you have being released when you're close to someone, when you're feeling it, when you're in the moment, when you feel connected to them, that's the, all those neurotransmitters are being released. You're getting all their brain rewards. So again, the more brain rewards you get, of course, your sexual satisfaction is going to increase, right? And then your book, again, does talk about non-monogamy quite in depth. And your book gets into different cultures, histories, places in the world where non-monogamy is a thing. But again, non-monogamy, if you look back at ancient humans, in my marriage and family class, I teach this for sociology, that the main type of relationship for humans was not a monogamous one. It was the non-monogamous, polyamorous types of relationships throughout human history. And you see this across species. Like 
go look at dolphins. There's usually one female and three males. They work as a team to fight off everybody else. It's all about access to females. That's deep evolutionary psychology. I don't want to go too deep into that lecture. You guys watch that lecture. I put it in as an assignment. So it's, <laughs> you know, but that's that idea. Why would three males work together? Why do dolphins engage in all types of sexual stuff? Like dolphins engage in sex with not just dolphins, but whales, whatever. Dolphin sexuality is very diverse. And they say dolphins are the closest to humans, right? Again, so humans like dolphins, engage in all types of sexual behaviors that often deviate with or are in line with cultural norms. And again, we brought it up. Why do we need cultural norms? Because we need to stop people from having sex with children. We need to stop rape of men and women. We need to stop people from violating animals because people will engage in these things. All right. So there's a reason that we socially construct laws, policies, mores, folkways, taboos, all of these things to check human behavior. We regulate human sexuality so it doesn't cause a dysfunctional society, essentially. And then um, to wrap things up, divorce is something I used to always talk about across my sociology classes because it relates to pretty much every subject, right? Is culture related to divorce? Absolutely, because depending upon your culture, it dictates whether it's acceptable. Do you have a legal system place in order to take care of this? Those kinds of stuff. Is socialization at play? Yes, because you're socialized and what's acceptable regarding divorce. Is it okay or is it not? And other things, right? Um, the groups you belong to matter because like if you're Catholic or let's just combine groups and religion, do, the, do both of those influence divorce? Yes, because the groups you belong to, like if you're Catholic, for example, are more against divorce than other religions, for example. You know what I mean? Uh, other factors like race. Is race associated with it? Yes. Like, you know, some races, it's more taboo. Like uh, divorce rates are higher for whites than other races because it's, it just seems like it's more acceptable for whites in their culture, I guess, than other races in their culture, I guess. Not sure, but again... We live in a racially segregated society that's not as race segregated as it used to be, but as a result of segregation, you end up with race-based cultures that are separate a little bit from each other, even though they're all part of American culture. And then if you, whatever group you belong to dictates the culture that you're exposed to. And then within this culture, you learn you know, to internalize the norms of that culture that you belong to and so on and so forth. But in general, in America, 1950, one in four ended in divorce in 1970 to now one in two. So you're starting to see a pretty drastic uh, changes there in our attitudes toward divorce. But again, a lot of this has to do with civil rights. It has to do with the women's rights movement. Like 1950s, women couldn't really leave their abusive husbands. Now in modern times, who's going to stop them? You know what I mean? And thank God, <laughs> because seriously, but that's how America used to work, right? We used to force women to stay in these abusive relationships even though women still get stuck in these. That's a whole other topic on violence and domestic violence. And if you want to hear that lecture, just check out my domestic violence lecture on my social problems class on my YouTube. It's all up there for you. And then sexuality and aging. Again, our attitudes towards sexuality, the type of behaviors that we engage in regarding sexuality depends upon all these things we've been talking about. Culture, um, health factors, et cetera. Like your book has a graph of different countries and it says like in the western world we tend to have more sex as we're aging than in the middle east and in parts of asia based upon the surveys that your book was looking at okay you also have the sexual double standard in aging and that you always have the james your book talks about the james bond guy always getting the younger girl you know and do we have that same standard for females you know and that was an interesting, so I put that in there just to talk about. But in general, people over 60, 50% engaged in some form of sexual activity. But whether people still engage in sexual activity long after their you know, middle adulthood is associated with, were they having sex before? Again, use it or lose it kind of attitude. How much were they engaging in in their early life? Health and illness. What's the condition of your body and mind, Right. Um, your general attitudes towards sexuality. Again, these cultural attitudes, your individual attitudes that are influenced by your culture, 
general exercise, alcohol intake, physical changes, all of this is also associated with whether or not you engage in sexual behavior. But again, this is a psychology class, so we're always taking that biopsychosocial approach to everything. So we need to be thinking about how is our biology influencing our sexual desire, arousal, et cetera? How are our cognitions, both unconscious and conscious, influencing what we decide to do? And then, and then you know, regarding our behavior, and then how does the social context really mold our behavior and structure our behavior? All these things we should always be thinking about throughout this class. But you know, again, some of this lecture is a little bit taboo, even hard for me to discuss. So please, you know, take a couple extra seconds and look at those first pages of the book and, you know, check it out. All right. Y'all have a wonderful day.